This morning, my name is Katy Berry, and we have the worship band up here, and we are ready just to get up off your seats, get up off that couch, get dancing and praising and worshiping the Lord with every fiber of your being. Let's do it. There is an ocean deeper than the tide is 
God gave his son in a beautiful exchange. And it was only his love that could save us. Tomorrow we're going to be celebrating Memorial Day and we are going to be remembering all the men and women who gave their lives just as Jesus did. They gave their lives in a sacrifice so we could be free. Just as Jesus gave his life so that we could be free from our sins. Let's remember all of those people now and the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus made.
as we sing the hymn, The Old Rugged Cross. On a hill far away stood the old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame Thank you for joining us for worship wherever you are. We are so glad that you have been able to lift your voice to the risen Christ with us today. And if you are tuning in for the very first time, I'd like to extend a special invitation of welcome to you. And we are honored and delighted to have you with us. If you would like to learn more about who we are as a church, I invite you to go to our website, perditobay.church, and you can read about all of the things that make us distinct and about our mission and our vision as we seek to be the heart of the community and make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. One of the great programs that our church offers is our preschool to our community. And this week, our preschoolers had their graduation. It wasn't a traditional graduation where all of the parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters could gather into this space and see our sweet kids walk across the stage. But our wonderful preschool director, Miss Bridget, had a drive-through area for our preschoolers to celebrate the graduation they had been working toward. And so we want to congratulate each and every one of those children who graduated from our Perdita Bay UMC preschool and wish them well as they go off to kindergarten and to express a deep appreciation for all of our preschool teachers who love those kids so wonderfully and help them grow in their development. It is truly a joy to see our preschool classes each year, to see the wonderful children that God entrusts to us as a preschool to shape and to form into the, more into the image of who God is and has created them to be. 
We continue during this time to meet as our COVID-19 task force to, to, to discuss the many things that are going on in our area. Our task force met this week and made the difficult decision, but we believe the most important and wise decision, and that is to suspend all in-person gatherings on our campus through the end of July. And you can find more information about our task force and more information about this decision on our Facebook page and on our website. We have been praying diligently, listening to the, all the available science and data to make the most informed decisions we can as a church to live by the words that Christ gave us, to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And we are seeking to make decisions in line with this teaching that Christ gave to us. One of the great opportunities we have as we gather for worship, whether in our living rooms or when we are able to be together, is to cast our prayers at the very foot of the cross of Almighty God. During this time, so many persons are experiencing the pain of losing jobs or having to suffer the loss of a loved one, wrestling with uncertainty. We know that these are indeed difficult times for so many, but we want to remind each of you of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ and the great joy that we have to take all of our burdens, all of our fear, all of our pain, and to give all of those things over to God, knowing that He promises us His peace which passes all understanding, and that he is with us in the valleys of faith and on the mountains of faith. So would you please join me as we pray together to Almighty God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to bring our prayers and our concerns to you. God, for those who feel a loss of hope, may you remind them of the hope of Jesus Christ and the hope of his empty tomb. For those, O oh God, who are wrestling with illness, God, may you provide your healing. For those who are grieving, may you give strength and peace and comfort. God, in this time of silence, we offer the prayers on our hearts over to you. Lord Christ, you are our good shepherd. Please take all of these prayers, all of these petitions, and gather them unto you. And may you respond to our prayers in your infinite wisdom. And may you give us discipline. May you give us obedience. May you give us unwavering trust to listen for your voice, to listen for your Holy Spirit to respond to these prayers in the ways, O oh God, that you know are best for each and every one of us. Almighty God, encounter us anew as we open your scriptures and as we seek to be shaped ever more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask all of these things in his holy name and pray as he taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You are now invited to watch a children's moment with our children's minister, Ms. Hannah. Good morning, everybody. I hope you guys have been staying well for this whole time we haven't been able to see you. I hope you know that you are loved and you are missed and we've been praying for you. I wanted to do a quick children's message today on the golden rule and that comes from Matthew 7 verse 12 and it says, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. I have with me a mirror. So Sam, can you smile at yourself in that mirror? What happens when you smile into the mirror? What does that guy do? What does he do? He put his fingers in his mouth. <laughs> he put his fingers in his mouth. That shouldn't happen. Abby, what happens when you frown at the mirror? It does the same thing. It does the same thing, yes. So oftentimes, even in real life, yes, we can't always see each other's faces right now because of masks. But when we smile at other people, what happens? 
they smile back. Yeah, they smile back. And the same thing happens with our actions. We want to try our best to be kind in all circumstances because if we want other people to be kind to us, we have to be kind to them as well. And the Bible even tells us to do so. We certainly have to love others for them to love us as well. All right, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week and a good start to your week and a good Sunday today. Good morning, church. Thank you, Miss Hannah. We are sure going to miss having her as our children's director, but looking forward to Debbie coming on board as the new children's director and having Hannah work with our kids still as one of the parents, active parents in our children's ministry. This morning's passage of scripture comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he also called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Ooh, we got a lot of big theology in Romans 8. That is the text before us. Ten days after Elizabeth, my wife, and I were married, we were already loading up onto a church bus, and I was following her to Peru. Ten days after we were married, I would have followed Elizabeth anywhere in the world. But she was a youth minister at the time, and so I went with her on this trip, this mission experience with a bunch of high school youth down to Peru, and uh, this strange thing started happening to me because I have been a preacher on mission trips before, especially in other cultures and in other contexts, and what often will happen is uh, the, the receiving churches will want the pastor of the group to be recognized in a worship service, and sometimes even preach or speak. But I didn't want the trip to be about me, and I didn't really want to have to be put on the spot to preach a sermon, and this may surprise some of you, but I actually get nervous when I'm called upon to do impromptu speaking. I don't mind preparing something, working with the Holy Spirit, putting together uh, what I think is is a sermon that really proclaims the truth and the Word of God, but just standing up and doing it out of nowhere... uh, does make me a little nervous, a little uncomfortable. And so I started asking the frontline Peru mission organization personnel whenever I had chance, all right, so when we go to these churches, is anybody going to ask me to speak? Because I don't want to. I want the youth to be highlighted. I want them to speak the message and to share. And they said, that's fine. Your youth can do the talking. You just might have to get up and say thank you and uh, and greetings on behalf of your home church and uh, a thank you for letting us come be a part of the Peru Christian Church. And I said, that would be fine. Two to three minutes, I got it. And so we were in the the biggest of the worship services we went to while we were in Peru. And uh, there were all kinds of different people there worshiping God. And I felt this hand grip my shoulder and a middle-aged man whispered, follow me. And so I got up and I followed him and we went to the back of the church sanctuary and uh, into this little room and uh, suddenly there were these other men. I would learn later that the guy who grabbed me was the pastor and these other guys were the elders of the church. They all laid their hands on me and they started praying for me and uh, it was in Spanish. I didn't understand many of the words they used, but I really enjoyed the prayer. And as I kind of stood up and was thanking them, for this prayer, I realized I was being introduced to my translator. 
And I said, you know, I, I don't really need a translator. Our group already has a translator. It's fine. We're doing well. And they said, no, no, no. This is your translator for this morning. We need you to preach at least 30 minutes. You can preach an hour, but it needs to be 30 minutes. And then uh, if you would just take pauses whenever you can at the end of a complete thought, the translator will translate what you're saying into Spanish. And I mean, the nerves started coming over me. And I said, you know what? We're going to let our youth speak. We've told them about having to speak. They, they want to share some stories about what they've done here and why they're here and they know the translator. And they said, oh yeah, we're going to do all of that and then you're going to preach a 30-minute sermon. It can be, you know, up to an hour. And I said, no, what about if I just do a couple of minutes, a welcome, a thank you? And, and they said, that's right, you do that. 30 minutes at least. Make sure it's 30 minutes. They kept saying, the pastor kept saying what it needed to be. And, and I got really nervous and, and I could start feeling the nervousness in my fingers and my toes. You know how you get when you're kind of put on the spot and I was pulled out there on, in front of everyone. It was a big, it was a big group of people, and I'm not used to speaking through a translator. My preaching doesn't really go well that way. My speaking doesn't even really go well that way. I realized I didn't even have a Bible in my hand, and so I grabbed a Bible off of one of the youth, and I thought, what in the world? I haven't even given a thought to what's going to come out of my mouth, but my former senior pastor, his favorite verse of Scripture was Romans 8, 26, 27, 28, and so I just opened it up and read those verses and hoped words would come to me. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good, for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. Now I'd heard my mentor, Dr. Carl Stegall, preach on these words so many times. But I couldn't remember the words he said. And so I just prayed, Spirit, give me the words. And I started talking, and something strange came over me. And 32 minutes later, I said, Amen. And I had a new confidence that while I am not a saint, it is true that when we are weak, God's Spirit is strong for the glory of God. That God gave me the words. They weren't mine, but that I needed to share in that moment because it really did seem to go well with the congregation and with our young people. And later that night in the room, I was sharing this good news with the boys. I, I was assigned to the 17-year-old uh, male youth as one of their chaperones. And so we were talking about this as everyone was getting ready in the dorm room for sleep that night. And, uh, and, and I was talking about how God just came through and, and spoke for me. And one of them said, well, what about the next verse? I wasn't schooled enough in the scriptures to know exactly what he meant. And so we opened it up and here's verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You see, what had happened is I'd gotten a little street cred with the youth for preaching off the cuff like that. And they had heard the feel-good, happy Romans 8 sermon that I had preached in front of the congregation in Peru, but they wanted to know about the rest of the story. They wanted to know why I ignored verse 29. And they said, you know, outside of our Methodist church, that they had heard Christians, and some of them even learned this in their Christian school, that uh, it, it is actually true that humans are not free to have faith in Christ that it's already predecided who will be saved and who will be damned, and that we don't, as humans, have any control over our destiny. God alone will choose who has salvation and who doesn't. They wanted to know why we ignored these verses about predestination. And so I shared with them the truth that we don't ignore these verses, that, that we do believe in verse 29 as the word of God. We just don't believe in the doctrine of predestination. And we don't talk about it all that much, especially in a Sunday morning sermon, not just because it's difficult to talk about, but, but because we know this is a place where Christians interpret the scripture differently. Good, faithful people. And, and while I interpret it differently and Wesleyans interpret it differently and, and a lot of uh, Christian thinkers think different ways about this, it doesn't mean that anybody's wrong or anyone has a monopoly on understanding God's word. We can still disagree with grace and not with contention. It just means we disagree. We interpret it differently. Well, 17-year-old boys don't really like that, by the way. You probably are aware. In fact, you may not even like it. 
You may not understand how someone isn't wrong and you can still disagree with them, but that's life. There are a lot of things about which I disagree with people, but that doesn't make them wrong just because I disagree with them. And so we disagree in grace and not in anger or contention or malice. And that's really why you don't often hear Romans 8, 29 preached about because there is so many different interpretations of it. But then they challenged me again. And they said, well, that doesn't make sense. You either believe in it or you don't. And you can't say you believe in Romans 8, 29 and not believe in the doctrine of predestination. And I said, oh, yes, you can. And I began to explain to them with my Wesleyan eyes how I understand that. And if you've ever wondered or interested, then this is definitely the sermon for you. It is difficult to to wade into these deep waters and you have to be really cognizant of the words you use because I actually do believe in predestination. I do. And I hope this isn't where your live stream cuts off. And if it does, make sure you go back and listen to what I say next because this is really important in today's world. If you know what that means... I believe in predestination as Paul wrote about it and as it was understood until the 16th century. I do not believe in the doctrine of predestination, which was a reinterpretation by Calvin and Calvinists in the 16th and 17th century. And so that just makes it complicated. What I believe Paul is telling us in Romans 8 is that there is a predestiny. There's a destiny that God has already designed, and it's called heaven. And that is the eternity God wants for all his creation. But I don't believe that that necessarily means just because he has a destiny in store for us, that we all will choose by faith to be a part of that destiny. I believe that God alone is responsible for my salvation, but that I have to have faith in God, in Christ, to be saved. I I believe that we are saved solely by God's grace and that God's pre-designed destiny for his creation is heaven, but I also to believe that while his grace is given to everyone, People have to be willing to receive it. They have to want to respond to it. Some of us will and some of us won't. If we confess our sin and our freedom and receive and accept and trust in his pardoning grace, then we can have faith in Christ and know it as salvation. But what I cannot find is scriptural is a doctrine that says God's created two teams of people. Those for sure are going to heaven. There ain't nothing they can do about it. And those who are for sure going to hell and there is nothing that they can do about it. I I, I just don't think that that is found in our scripture. In fact, the United Methodist Church says a belief like that is contrary to the total insight of the Bible and to common sense to suppose that God would foreordain anyone to go to hell. I, I believe that that understanding or the doctrine of predestination is, is evil. If, if it says that it's already a pre-chosen, a pre-decided, pre-ordained determination at your birth if you're going to heaven or if you're going to hell. If, if I believe that, then how could I believe that God and Jesus Christ is all good? If I believe that, then why would I teach confirmation students? When I teach a group of young people about having faith in Christ, I believe that everyone listening to the sound of my voice has the opportunity for salvation. I really do believe that. And I believe that the scriptures teach us that, that Christianity is open to all people. Everyone is invited into the kingdom of heaven. In fact, if you were with us in worship of a few Sundays ago, watching us online or here in person, you heard me preach from the three chapters prior to Romans 8, where it said, therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are justified. We are saved by faith. Since our very beginning, since our Genesis in 15, 6, it said, Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Likely the most well-known passage of Scripture is John 3, 16, for God so loved the whole world 
that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That means all of us have the opportunity. Everyone has the chance by faith to believe in Christ and to have salvation. Christ didn't come to offer salvation to just a few elect, but Christ came for the whole world. That's why we're an evangelical church. That's why we go out into the community and share the good news of Jesus Christ because we believe that everyone has the chance and needs to hear the word of God so that they might believe in Christ and be saved. Yes, God has chosen a destiny for us, for everyone to put our faith in his son, Jesus Christ, and to be saved and then be justified and sanctified and glorified as Romans 8 says. But it doesn't mean that everyone's going to go along with that design that God has for our salvation. Some of us will choose faith in Christ, and some of us will not choose his way of life, his truth, his righteousness. And I know that uh, my Reformed theological friends, I went to seminary with a lot of them. These were the types of people that would fall down the steps at Emory and say, oh, thank God that's over with who would challenge me about my understanding of predestination and the doctrine of predestination. And they say, yeah, but what about this word foreknowledge that's used here in verse 29? If Paul claims that God has foreknowledge, then how can humans have any choice in the matter of all? Well, that's when I like to bring up blue crab. I love Freshly steamed blue crab right out of the Gulf of Mexico. When I was a little kid, my favorite meal was to go down just a short drive from Dothan and get a big old bucket of steamed blue crab. And I would crack open those shells and pull out that succulent white meat and dip it into drawn butter. And when I tasted it, it was like I was sitting at the feast of heaven. That's how much I loved the taste of blue crab. And so if it was my birthday and my parents plopped me in the car and we drove down and spent the day at the beach and then they were taking me out to birthday dinner and back then where we went, there were about two options for dinner. One was the country kitchen and one was uh, Billy's crab house. They knew before they even asked the question what I would decide. But if they had asked the question, David, do you want to go to the country kitchen and get tonight's special, which is liver and onions with stewed spinach? Or do you want to go to Billy's and get a bucket of steamed blue crab? They knew every single time, 100% of the time, I was going to choose to go eat blue crab. They knew that. It didn't mean that I did not have the freedom to choose. Of course, I could have chosen. It was my birthday. They gave me the right. I could choose either one. But I was going to choose every single time to go to Billy's. Even if for some strange reason I didn't feel like blue crab, I'd go there at least for the French fries or the hush puppies instead of going and sitting in front of steamed spinach and some liver. I mean, come on. Now, my parents are smart people, but compared to God... I mean, God is so much more intelligent, so much more wise than my earthly parents. And so, of course, he knows what I'm going to choose before I choose it. He's God. I mean, how much better our Father in heaven knows us than even we know ourselves. And, and, and so to think that because God already knows what I'm going to decide somehow limits my freedom to choose, I just can't understand that. I, I don't think that that's necessary. I don't think that Paul used the word foreknowledge to try to limit human freedom. I don't think he was talking about humans at all when he used the word foreknowledge. He was talking about God. He wasn't saying foreknowledge means that salvation is some arbitrary decision of God of who's going to be saved and who isn't. God's much too good for arbitrary salvation. God's foreknowledge means that God knows the end. God already knows what we're going to choose in our freedom. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, said it this way, God looking on all ages from the creation to the consummation as a moment and seeing at once whatever is in the hearts of all his children knows everyone that does or does not believe in every age or nation. Yet what he knows, whether faith or unbelief, is not caused by his knowledge. I think God knows and we still have the freedom to choose. God's God. 
But I do also understand that Reformed thinkers did not only develop the doctrine of predestination and interpret predestination differently than it had been interpreted because of foreknowledge. They also did it because they were really trying hard to protect God's sovereignty. It was more important for the Calvinists in the 16th and 17th century to proclaim God's power, God's sovereignty, than it was for human freedom. And stick with me, please. I know we're given a lot of big theological words, but what we believe about God is so important. I mean, studying who God is and his attributes is so important to life every day. And so while they were trying to protect his power, they developed this doctrine of predestination that said, well, there must be some limited atonement, that that some shall be saved and some shall be damned, and that grace, if God graces you, you have to accept it, you have to receive it. It it is uh, irresistible. There's no way that you can deny it. And, And so what happened in that system of theology is it really did take away an understanding of human freedom because to them, it was more important to assert God's sovereignty than humans' freedom. But I I just don't think that God's sovereignty is defined by the ability to make people do certain things or behave in certain ways. I don't really think God is trying to teach us that that is what power is. I think God's trying to redefine our human understanding of power, actually. I mean, I do believe that God can do whatever God chooses to do, and I just suggest that God's power is not defined by human understanding of control. His authority does not come from his iron fist or his ability to make you do something. His authority, his power comes from something much deeper than our human understanding of success and kingship. It's much mightier than human control. It is found in his compassion. God's power comes in his love in his, as the scriptures say, agape. God's power is seen when you look at the cross of Jesus Christ. That's God's power. The life and death of Jesus challenges us to redefine our human understanding of power and authority and kingship by looking at the Lamb of God. And that's who Christ is. What Jesus does, what the gospel does, is it takes our human understanding of power, redefines it, and hands it back to us so that we might reassess what it means to have a ruler or a king who doesn't use control as a source of light and truth, but uses love as a source of light and truth and power. That is God's instrument of authority. If you make someone love you, even if it's against their will, it's not really love. It's not even really power. I mean, for instance, when I fell in love with Elizabeth, if I had the ability to make her fall in love with me, I would have used it. I would have exercised that ability. But how much more powerful is our relationship that I don't have that ability, that Elizabeth freely fell in love with me as I freely fell in love with her? It makes our love so much more pure that neither of us were forced into that relationship. It's the same with God. I freely choose to love God who loves me so fully. And with faith, if God forced me to have faith in Christ, even if it was against my will, can you even really call that faith or call that trust? No, we freely believe and trust in God and Christ. I don't think it threatens God's sovereignty, God's power to say we have freedom. In fact, I think human freedom reinforces God's true sovereignty. So God does have foreknowledge and God has a predestined path for our salvation and a place for all his people, just as Romans 8 suggests. But this in no way to me presupposes a doctrine of predestination that it's already decided who will be in heaven and who will be in hell and that there is nothing, not even our own faith, that can affect our eternity. But you see, if you go along with that, if you say, you know, that sounds like what I believe too, Pastor, then Romans 8 not only comes with the assurance that you do have a place 
and a part to play and a decision and, and a chance to believe in God and Christ and be saved, but it also comes with a challenge that you do have a part to play, that you do have to choose faith in Christ. Every single day, we must recommit ourselves to our faith in God, in Christ. Every day, we should choose with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with every word, with every action, to live into the image of Jesus Christ and to put our faith in His way and in His truth and in His life. That's the challenge of these verses. It's also the assurance of them that if we do that, what follows is that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus the Lord. No doctrine of theology, no hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, death, life, angel, ruler, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus the Lord. Will you choose to love Christ? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're now going to go to a time of offering ourselves back to God as we present to Him His tithes and our offerings. There are methods for doing this available on the screens. You can also, if you would like, uh, contact the church office about ways that you might continue to give. During this time, we are mindful of the fact that the need of the church is great. And we are the church and will continue to help build his kingdom in this world as we be the heart of the community.
Receive now this benediction. May the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the peace and the promise of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace, recommitting yourself to faith in Christ this day and forevermore. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.